from the earliest account of man's religious life. Sleep phenomena has been associated with oracles. We find evidences of this among practically all primitive peoples and records, historical and otherwise, have descended from the more advanced culture groups. Sleep was regarded as a magic condition. It was in some ways a suspension of our outer life. The soul, it was assumed, could depart from the body, could visit into remote regions, and ascending through the various orbits of the world, come close to the divine principles at the root of life. Because dream phenomena were so obviously not of this world, it was assumed that there was another world in which dreams were real. And in the ancient Greek art, we have representation of the gate of sleep leading from the mortal state into a strange temple where shadowy and phantom forms lurk in the gloom or perform weird ritualistic dances around the altars of some ancient deity. It was not, however, in Greek culture alone that sleep gained the strange oracular authority which later came to be associated with it. Sleep was not only natural, but could be induced by artificial means. Very far back, men developed the hypnotic arts, although they did not know them by such a name. They found ways by mesmeristic passes and mesmeric formulas to induce artificial sleep and to throw a subject into a state of somnambulism. At Delphi, the greatest of all the Grecian oracles, a kind of trance or ecstasy was induced by vapors rising from a deep vent in the earth. These vapors had an intoxicating effect. And when the priestess was seated on her tripod over this vent, she inhaled the fume and passed into a strange, half sleeping condition. And while in this state, gave forth the oracle or the messages from the deity in the form of that sanitary verse. In the ancient grotto of Sophonius, another celebrated oracle of the time, those seeking answers to their question were conducted down into a cave-like place. Here again there seems to have been either some natural fume uh, which intoxicated the mind, or possibly those de uh, deciding to spend the night there were given drugs to induce visions. Drugs for this purpose are well known. Uh, perhaps the most exciting example being the use of hashish by the sect of the assassins in Iraq. Here a very powerful drug brought with it extraordinary ocular hallucination, causing those who took it to believe that they had been transported into the paradise promised by Mohammed in the Quran. Drugs were used by the Druids and the various incenses are frequently referred to. And in one uh, early work we know 
that some of the heretical Christian sects of the first two centuries were accused of drugging the communion cup in order to produce ecstasies and trances, during which religious experiences were recorded. In addition to this change, the sleep phenomena could be affected uh, by fasting and by the general weakening of the body, also by the use of certain foods or exercises or disciplines, producing a curious kind of fatigue. The American Indian induced a form of hypnotic trance by moving an eagle feather back and forth before the eyes of the subject. These trances could also be induced by music, by dance, by various ecstatic forms of ritualism, some of which have descended to us in the excitement and ecstasy of the Holy Rollers and other peculiar groups of Adventists. Thus we see that from an early time, men sought to induce artificial sleep, or in one way or another, uh, to destroy the norm normal equilibrium of man's objective awareness, casting him into some kind of glamour, either through drugging or through fatiguing the senses. Because in these states, he was held to have a peculiar proximity to spiritual mysteries. The motive was quite sincere. It was the only way, however, that these people believed that it was possible to open this door between the worlds and to find some means of retiring into the mystery of the divine Beautiful, or that other world which was closed to us by the ordinary orientation of our sensory perception. There is a very interesting Japanese fable of two young people in love who attempted to what, to what they called in those days a lope into the other world. It was a very curious thought, and of course it ended in suicide. But these the lovers were trying to break through again this barrier uh, which divided a condition of being from another condition of being. It was only assumed that the dream world was closely identified with the world of the dead. A man asleep appeared to be dead, but was not really so. Death was a long sleep. Sleep was a little death. St. Paul points this out, and he says, I die daily. This mystery of sleep and the breaking through seems to have affected our psychology and our general attitude toward life, and have descended subtly to us in a number of our beliefs and superstitions and legends. Now what does this tell us that may be of immediate importance? The oracular procedures of the Greeks could not have succeeded had the oracles of the Pythian Apollo at Delphi not been for the most part true. It is, of course, certain, and this is the out for the modern skeptic, that these oracles were often ambiguous, difficult of interpretation, obscure until the event actually transpired. But Cicero, gathering a record of these reports, came to the conclusion that the majority of them were wise beyond the wisdom of the world. But there was something about them 
that transcended the judgment of conscious man. And in many instances, of course, they were amazingly fulfilled to the smallest detail. The reason why the Greek oracles were famous and were consulted by persons in every class of life undoubtedly was the reputation which gradually built around them. This reputation for accuracy has also been mentioned by older writers, and the most grudging have admitted that these oracles were universally constructed, that their recommendations were for the private and public good, uh, that they did contribute a great deal to peace of mind and to the guidance of states and to the direction of leaders. And many of their less fortunate revelations also proved to be true. And warnings which they gave were seldom ignored without disaster. Even Socrates seems to have admired the oracles and to have acknowledged uh, that they represented perhaps one of the deepest sources of man's possible knowledge of life and the world. Many of the oracles were also broadly informative. They brought answers to questions in art, science, religion, philosophy. They assisted in the preservation of crops. They aided the agriculturists in his plans for the harvest. They warned of storms and of pestilences. And it was rather obvious to these people that such information was not normally to be attained in a waking state. Now the priestesses of Delphi, while selected with the greatest care, were mostly young women although some reached elder years with great dignity and distinction. Uh, these young women were not trained in the worldly pursuit which might have been possible to them in these days. They were virgins of the temple. They lived apart and alone, a cloistered existence. They were not instructed in statecraft or in medicine or in any of these subjects, but were assured that the truthfulness of their revelation depended upon the purity and integrity of their own lives. This, I think, is a further point of interest and one which uh, will bear consideration. Obviously, the normal state of man can be both naturally and artificially deranged. And among most older people, the insane, the mad, uh, those hopelessly infirm of mind were regarded with a peculiar veneration. They were believed to be very close to God. They were God's own. They did not belong, really, in this world. And it was the responsibility of all to treat them with kindness and to protect them, sometimes even from themselves. But this madness was something like the divine madness, the madness of the Dionysiac cult, induced by the juice of the vine, the intoxication which was held in religious ritual to open these mysterious interior perceptions. So that, of course, the use of wine in the sacrament, even to this time, originated in this Dionysiac rite, the rite of friendly, the rite by means of which the individual seemed to suddenly escape from his human limitations and to be able to commune with powers beyond this world, and even bring back messages of general interest. Many of these early American Indian tribes 
also made use of this broad concept. In their case, uh, usually trances were brought on either by hypnotic means or by a form of auto-suggestion. These old medicine priests seem to have been able to cast themselves into trances, more or less at will. And here, in tribal life, they had an unusual opportunity to demonstrate the accuracy of their foreknowledge. They were depended upon uh, in a time when no dependable sciences existed, when laws and codes did very little to protect either the individual or the group. The person who had no right, no privileges of legal or medical help, who was without any advantages of modern psychology or classical philosophy, built his life very largely upon phenomena. And this phenomena was nearly always uh, associated with sleep mystery and the power of the soul to depart in sleep to explore those things which it most needed to know. Now we can divide our thinking on this subject into two very broad patterns. The first, and one that is still held by many mystics, is that essentially the old concept was correct. That sleep does mysteriously liberate the soul from the body, or it's not a total liberation, at least gives the soul a more positive existence while the body is at rest. East Indian metaphysics intimates this same concept, that the soul can temporarily leave the body and can have adventures and experiences which may later be brought through into remembrance, or partly so although some elements uh, may evade us or elude us as we return to the waking state. The other broad school affirms that the phenomena of the dream can be rationally explained on a psychological level, that it is not actually that the soul leaves the body, but that the psychic nature comes into a new relationship to the personality during sleep. That in sleep condition, the objective person is in a state of almost complete suspension of animation. In sleep, the outer world loses its power to impress and influence us. In sleep, we appear to be temporarily free and the burden of even our own opinion. In sleep, a quietude descends upon the mind and the emotions, and they are at rest. This quietude makes possible a man's sensing of deeper phases of his own life. This quietude permits certain currents to seemingly reverse themselves. So that instead of man receiving his principal stimulation from the outside, he suddenly becomes passive and experiences life moving from within himself. That an inner world imposes itself upon the outer. Whereas in the waking state, this imposition from within is made comparatively impossible by the activities of the objective faculties. This is, of course, an essential concept of mysticism. And sleep becomes a kind of stillness, a natural form of mystical experience. In this stillness, the individual becomes acutely receptive. Now, what does he receive into this receptivity? Theoretically, at least, he can receive impressions from around him which might not normally be recorded. Even in sleep, 
man has certain kinds of awareness. But these are more subtle, dealing with the more sensitive values uh, than those of the waking state. Parapsychology researchers suggest the possibility that in the sleep state, man may attain a certain clairvoyance a certain at least clairsentient, a telepathic rapport with other persons. In sleep, he may sense more acutely the thoughts of his neighbors, friends, and associates. He may be more responsive intuitively uh, to the temperaments of those around him. In sleep also, he may receive into himself masses of telepathic fragments from the lives and thoughts and emotions of countless persons. These may or may not have any general meaning, but under some conditions they may also assume prophetic proportions. In this same general area, it becomes quite conceivable that man can attune himself to some kind of record or recording that remains in space around him at all times. We are not sure that space is non-intellectual. We are not sure that the air around us is not a mental atmosphere. We cannot be certain that nature itself does not have its own thinking and that in a receptive mood we may tune in to these larger thoughts, thoughts which perhaps we can later interpret in genius and great artistry. There seems to be a tendency also for this receptivity to be conditioned by certain major phases of our interest. We know that if we take certain thoughts to sleep, we may have dream experiences relating to these thoughts. We also recognize the age-old custom of taking problems to sleep, with the concept that in the morning we will awaken with the answer, and many have had this experience. We also know that great artists, great musicians and scientists have generally admitted the importance of sleep phenomena in the advancement of their various abilities. Musicians have heard their melodies in sleep, or dreams, or trance-like space. Artists have seen the pictures which they would later place upon canvas. Sleep also approximates another state of man, who cultivates a kind of sleep in the discipline of meditation and the various retrospective and contemplative exercises of the Greek theory and of the East Indian school. Uh, these meditations are quietude, leading finally perhaps to an almost complete submersion of the personal consciousness in a deep and mysterious ocean of universal values, such as is intimated in the Samadhi of Vedanta, or the mysterious Nirvanic trances of the Buddhist Arhat. Thus, contemplative disciplines bring about again this tendency to detach the mind from the commonplace, from the everyday and to submerge it more deeply in a tranquility, thus apparently opening the way for a sensitive perception of things, of energies, of forces, of influences, not otherwise immediately noticed. Out of this thinking, whether it be held to be mystical or psychological, we have come to certain practical conclusions, conclusions which affect the practice of modern psychology and psychiatry to a marked degree. One of the conclusions is 
that in many instances, sleep phenomena are a valuable aid to the interpretation of the psychic complex of the human personality. That under certain conditions, dreams are not only keys to characteristics, but do constitute a form of admonition, a warning or an inclination, a kind of instruction by which nature would seek to assist us in immediate understanding of some peculiarity of our own emotion or thought. We know that everywhere nature eternally strives to repair the damage that is caused by human ignorance. If this damage is too great, nature is not equal to the task. But wherever possible, nature sets into action auto-corrective mechanisms to assist us in restoring this equilibrium upon which normalcy and health depend. Thus, as surely as we secure or receive punches, feelings, we are also inclined to have this awareness of a need or a particular change in conduct, or a modification of habits. Many interesting experiences relating to this type of nature's helpfulness have been recorded. An individual, even without sleep, will suddenly become acutely aware of some deficiency in his own nature. He will have a flash of insight which forms a corrective pattern to deliver him from some emergency in which he is in danger of becoming involved. There are many instances of foreknowledge in this department, which have caused a person to cancel a trip on a train which was afterwards wrecked, or to not take a certain plane trip when the plane came to disaster. This kind of forewarning or premonition uh, we know because it is testified to by generations of sincere and thoughtful persons. Most of these warnings, however, pass unheeded. We rationalize ourselves out of them. There are numbers of cases also where we record persons who have come to grief as a result of ignoring some kind of intuitional flash which might have saved them. In our daily way of existence, uh, we do not take for granted that this internal insight is legitimate. We do not feel impelled to follow it. If it does not fit into our preconceptions, we ignore it. If it is inconvenient to follow its instructions, we violate them and have certain argumentative procedures by which we justify our own attitude. This is particularly true in the case of conscience, in which we do have certain very strong pressures, which sometimes are accepted and recognized, but often violated. We have no great at all explanation of the conscience process, but we are inclined to feel that uh, what we call conscience today has to do with the individual violating some preconception upon which he has le learned to lean, or the validity of which he has accepted. Therefore, conscience does not recognize, it does not represent any spiritualized faculty, but merely the voice of his traditional acceptances. Psychology, however, does recognize the fact that the violation of conscience mechanisms will nearly always prove detrimental. They destroy a degree of integration within the person. They cause him to have less faith in himself. They cause him uh, to feel less respect for his own nature.
if he feels that he is transgressing uh, some value which he holds to be real, he is disappointed in himself. And he also develops the fear mechanism because conscience usually involves some machinery of punishment. The individual who goes against his conscience is opening himself to some kind of retribution uh, which is not pleasant or to be desired. Now, conscience operates when we are awake, but we have every reason to suspect that it operates even more actively when we are asleep. For nearly all impulse and instinct are more powerful uh, when the conscious mind does not modify their pressures. The conscious mind of man causes a focalizing of objective awareness. The individual becomes acutely centered in his objective nature. In this uh, uh, centering, he is exceptionally responsive to the visible and physical things around him. And very little does he respond to the invisible, superphysical things within him. Thus he lives objectively and with very little recourse to the principles which lie locked within him. This brings us then to the elements or the chemistry of the psychic factor as it might be involved in dream phenomena. The question may be asked in the first place, does man know more when he is asleep than when he is awake? I would say that probably not but that he is more aware of what he knows. Uh, in the waking state, uh, the individual does not have immediate access uh, to the various levels of his own subconscious. In other words, he cannot be consciously aware of the subconscious. About the only part of his internal defense mechanism that is available to him is memory. Memory can issue warnings and does. Memory can remind him of the hazards of an enterprise and will do so. But the individual frequently resists memory on the ground that each new situation is a unique thing and therefore it cannot be explained merely by reference to previous experiences. Thus the burglar who has been jailed twice uh, may remember this, but it will not prevent him from making a third attempt to burglarize something on the ground that he now has perfected the perfect crime. Uh, later he will remember that this did not work either, but by that time he will be planning upon a new course of procedure which he believes will violate his expectancies of being caught. Uh, thus, memory does not serve us in everything, but memory makes available a small part of our own previous experience. A very great part of that general experience, however, is not rememberable by any conscious process and therefore only certain phases of our own disposition can be reached by uh, the memory uh, techniques. There are other parts which do not respond to this type of stimulation, for it must be the result of association mechanism to bring memory into operation. On the, uh, on the level of the unremembered, there may also be a great deal of that which is truly known, but that we know not that we know. Uh, this, in turn, causes a series of experiences which occasionally come into our objective understanding. Here again, we have inspirational moments. Here we have sudden uh, mystical stretches or spells or instants of insight, something totally beyond the ordinary, something that memory alone will not explain by normal procedure, 
is suddenly known to us. Now in this knowing to us, I believe there is another element that we have to bear in mind. It may have an effect upon uh, the entire problem of learning from dreaming. Man's inner life is undoubtedly archetypal. And by that I now mean that it represents a pattern. Man's internal organization is built upon law. It is a formula, lawful in itself, and depending for its continuance upon obedience to basic laws of existence. Thus, inside himself, man is a law-abiding creature, even though in his outer personality he may be a law-breaker. Man mentally, even emotionally, seeks to outwit his own lawfulness. He finds innumerable excuses, and in the course of ages, the external tradition of man has deviated markedly from the internal record or report. The reason for this has been that objectivity, uh, by the intensity of its processes, has come to uh, be regarded as the final reality. And the problems that arise around us have precedence over the pressures that arise within us. It is therefore, as a result of tradition, heredity, indoctrination, and experience, each of these for measure misunderstood. We arrive at a certain conclusion, or a certain attitude. We may develop a total personality, which is psychologically unsound. This personality uh, may not be so considered, either by the individual or by his associate, because he may live in a world in which this kind of unsoundness is prevalent. Most people being like himself, he considers his own nature to be normal. And in this sense of normalcy, he goes on breaking rules and laws imposed by nature, because others break these rules and laws. And so society becomes an order of law breakers rather than of law keepers. Such laws as uh, will bring with them immediate physical punishment, we are inclined to keep. But laws which affect us primarily on a psychic level, we neither understand nor appreciate, nor do we sense the need to obey them. This means, substantially, that the inner life of man may not condone his outer conduct, be entirely sympathetic with it, or recognize it as a best way of action. To meet this situation, man builds more and more rational defenses. He tries to convince himself, he psychologizes himself, or permits himself to form, to fall under the hypnosis of prevalent attitudes. Now, hypnosis produces a susceptibility to suggestion. The hypnotized person must, to a major, temporarily fulfill the wishes of the hypnotist. In the same way, a hypnotized Society must fulfill the pressures or purposes or accepted procedures of that society. Once we assume the normalcy of a social pattern, this social pattern begins to influence us. It moves in upon us. It re requires allegiance. It creates penetration by consistent repetition of its plan or its procedure. And today we take the child from its parent knee, place it into the school, the school continues to indoctrinate that child with certain beliefs, 
These beliefs are carried through into higher education. They then proceed on onto the business level of life. Then the individual marries someone with the same belief. These are further intensified. The young people become parents and pass on these same beliefs to their children. And all the time, these beliefs are becoming more believed by the person who holds them. After a time, it seems that there is no other way, that there could not possibly be any justifiable conflict, that these things with which we have hypnotized ourselves have to be true, that they are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And having taken this oath on the witness stand, we proceed to lie ourselves out of faith. We don't always intend to, but our witnesses under oath do not agree in their evidence. And the mere fact that we are even trying to be truthful does not help too much after we have forgotten how to be truthful. We are at a disadvantage all the way along. Thus we may build up two distinct levels of psychic entities. The outer level is dependent almost entirely upon outward circumstances, and it produces a more or less complete psychic being, created to obey the, the impressions and pressures around it. From this psychic being comes this kind of static drag that has been noted throughout human society. It causes the traditionalist. It causes the person who resists change, the dogmatist, and the exclusionist. It causes the reactionary, and impels persons in various walks of life to lock their own ways away from other people. It leads to legislation to protect entrenchment rather than progress. And all through this procedure, everyone is doing what he believes to be right, but he does not know what right actually means. Now you can go along like this, making a very choice, cultivated group of mistakes. He can go on breaking one natural law after another. And if his infringements are not too massive, he is very likely to drift through the years with only those general discomforts and inconveniences which he can blame on someone else. But actually, he is not living well. He is not being true to the rules of his own existence. He is betraying something inside of him while he is trying to protect the surface of his own consciousness. This situation frequently leads to the building up of pressure. The uh, variations of the personality from the inner integration of life may become more pronounced. Attitudes that are detrimental may take over. The individual may find himself inundated in his fears and worries. He may find his natural optimism ebbing away. He may discover that his health is vanishing by degrees and that he has not much longer to go before the general error of his ways will result in the disintegration of his mortal compound. This situation can and often does result in a desperate effort or a meaningful effort on the part of the archetypal consciousness to reassert itself over the life of this individual. I think we are safe in saying that while man, by himself in a forest, could not necessarily learn to read and write, that in this state of isolation, had he the proper faculties, he could gain a very profound knowledge of many values. He could become intelligent without becoming intellectual. In the same thinking, uh, the individual living in the confusion of times and confusion of situations, can become intellectual without being intelligent. Intelligence has something of integrity about it. 
Intellectualism has merely self-justification and the eternal desire to prove that we are right without very much incentive to make sure that we are right. If then we find a life going outwardly, contrary to its inward need, I think we have learned from long observation and experience that nature will not permit this disaster without making some effort to correct the situation. If there seems to be no way in which the person can receive the necessary instruction as a result of his own ability to interpret values, this instruction is pressed upon him from within himself in some symbolic form, in some way which it is hoped or believed he can understand or accept. Sometimes this pressure is so great that it breaks through even in the hours of waking. But as the hours of sleep are nearly always available and represent a minimum of resistance on the part of this badly oriented personality, it is most common for these uh, important recommendations to be impressed upon us in the form of dream symbols. The subconscious of man is not a structure that is capable of molding forms with its own hands. It has no voice as we understand voice. It does not speak as we understand speech. It cannot impress itself directly upon us because of its own nature which is essentially formless. We have no actual ability to behold the face of integration. We do not know what it looks like. But we do recognize that it can be communicated or in one way or another made somewhat evident to us by means of symbols. Actually, we have no ability to understand any abstraction unless this abstraction is closed, is put into a likeness or guise which is comprehensible. It is impossible for us to draw a picture of virtue. The only way we can understand it is by means of examples, and examples are a form of symbolism. We use the example to indicate the principle, and in education today, the example method is still one of the dominant ways of imparting new ideas. Even a formula remains comparatively meaningless until an example is provided. So in our dream or thought process, any important message must be conveyed to us by means of material supplied by our own psyche. Now, the psyche, which it is uh, important to reach with this impression, is the objective one. And the symbolism of objective man is derived from the objective world in which he lives. He derives his symbols from things or relationships or conduct patterns. And by these patterns, he seeks to communicate uh, virtues of one kind or another. In the days of the early church, when most persons were illiterate, and only the clergy could read the Bible, religious instruction was imparted by means of pictures. Uh, the walls of the churches and chapels and cathedrals were ornamented with scenes from the life of Christ. Uh, these were explained by the priest or the deacon, and they came Therefore, pictures of quality. These pictures were enlarged to include the parable and the principal admonitions of Jesus, and were further complicated or enlarged by the production of miracle plays on the porches or the broad squares before cathedrals. Here, dramatically, the lives of saints, the various moral virtues, the victory of good over evil, the story of the prodigal son, 
or the tale of the Good Samaritan were enacted in order that the people might thus become aware through a simple symbol of the natures and substances of invisible virtues which could not be directly traced of themselves. Thus when some kind of abstract impulse is communicated from the archetypal psyche to the objective mind, there must be an adequate way of communication. Now if we would assume that this subjective is a kind of ancient teacher, is the instructor, is the sage, or the saint, or the savior, the prophet, the priest, uh, the philosophic physician. We can perhaps estimate what our reaction would be if some such a person should suddenly enter into our physical way of life. Supposing some very wise person uh, made himself available to the needs of a very foolish man. The chances are the entire procedure would be utterly non-productive. The wise man would not be accepted by the foolish man. His wisdom would be regarded as old fogeyish advice. He would be told that he belonged to a decadent generation, that the qualities which he tried to teach were old-fashioned and uh, no longer uh, applicable. Uh, that uh, the only way to live would be the very way which was causing the trouble. Thus the direct admonitional procedure would be of very little value unless it was accompanied by something by which it was distinguished, by which it was set apart from common experience, and in which something stronger than words became the basis of the communication of ideas. Sometimes, therefore, your archetypal image will impress itself in the form of a vision in which a person, usually a celestial or sublime being, suddenly appears as though in actual reality, uh, communicates the instruction, the, or gives the warning or the admonition, and then vanishes back into the mysterious abstract regions from which it came. The impact of such an experience, visual and audible, upon the lower personality is much more profound by the very mystery with which it is involved. Such a visitation, so-called, could not be taken lightly. And the course of history has frequently been changed by visions of this kind. Yet the admonition given in the vision was not something entirely unknown to the person who received it. It was an admonition subconsciously known, internally recognized to be true, but ignored or willfully forgotten by the ambitious person who did not wish to be limited uh, by the dictates of his own conscience. Thus the question as to whether this type of visitation represents the addition of knowledge or merely the revelation of the known, a new degree of impression from that which is eternally true. This is a situation of psychological uh, significance. There is another point that I think is interesting in connection with this, uh, namely the so-called warning or uh, instructive admonition. We know perfectly well that if a truly enlightened person was to thoroughly estimate our conduct, or in some now devised impartial mechanism, some machine which impersonally accepted all the factors of our personality into an equation, that such a machine could theoretically give us a fairly concise statement of our probabilities in a given situation. Also, we know that had we the wisdom enough, 
we could foresee things that would likely arise. We could avoid difficulties uh, that are practically inevitable because of the course we are following. Yet these things are not evident to us in our normal state. Thus the admonitional or instructive vision or dream does not necessarily mean that a foreign or outside entity is instructing. It can well mean that a deeper and better part of ourselves is providing us with a larger measure of insight into the probabilities of our own conduct than would be objectively possible. And because the universe is lawful, and because all conduct must have its consequences, there are many phases of prophecy which only represent recognition of cause and effect and their inevitable operation. A new vitality, a new power with which to cope with illusion, or with which to uh, achieve victory over error, which otherwise appears to be closing in upon him. The usual problem, then, is to recognize the dream as a symbolical group of symptoms, symptoms which have to do with some phase of character or temperament. These symptoms most frequently express themselves. Uh, as a result of a critical alignment of problem factors. Very often they will proceed at crisis, and if they are not in some way regarded, uh, the individual from then on falls immediately into a more desperate situation. The symbols used in such dreams are derived, as we mentioned last week, from a kind of vocabulary of natural figures, natural uh, objects, which have certain interpretive overtones, as objects with which we particularly associate values. These values arising from our mythology, our legendary, our lore, art, literature, or culture, and values which have become accepted as a language of value by ourselves. We can easily understand that the objective nature must reach as far as it can into the subjective to meet this impression pattern that is seeking to come through. Uh, the objective uh, refines itself from things seen or tasted or smelt or touched uh, to things which are overtones. It moves as far toward the abstract as it can, and the abstract moves as far downward toward the concrete as possible. And if we are fortunate, there is a meeting of these two, forming a bridge for the actual communication of the instruction, such as whatever it may be. So we will say that nearly anyone who is under psychic pressure of any kind is subject to these warnings, to these diagnostic aids, which are intended to make possible his rapid recognition of his own condition and to inspire him to a proper remedy. If man, from the very early part of his culture, had continued to remember this psychic factor in himself, had clung firmly to these dream symbols, had accepted the meaning of them uh, more generally and more generously. The chances are there would be very little need for psychologists today. Each individual could interpret his own inner life. But because we have raced headlong past these patterns, because we have relegated most symbolism to a mythological and imaginary sphere, we have forgotten that symbolism is a continuing language, that the myths and legends that we have learned or have remembered are still the fabric 
for the communication of subjective impulse. We no longer literally accept the myth, but the myths themselves continue to form this alphabet of meaningful symbols for the communication of internal impulse. So I feel that it is quite proper and right to say that man does receive a kind of instruction, that he does have the right upon request or in need to achieve a closer sense of conscious identity with his own total existence in order that all of himself may be available to the emergency that arises. If he does not take advantage of this right and privilege which he has in nature, then the fault lies largely with himself, and not with nature's intention. For nature wishes him to make the correction. It is his own audacity which causes him to refuse. So in the problem of this type of correction, it is obvious that the message bears a direct relationship to the personal need. And as persons interpreting myths and legends interpret them differently, so that even mythologists have no common mind on these things, so it is true that symbols have different meanings to different persons and at different times. But always there is a meaning, and that meaning is always in some way related uh, to our own personal psychological pattern. So, uh, taking this thinking, we know that in philosophy, for example, there has always been the recommendation that the individual in the presence of a serious decision should pause and reflect. Now it is this peculiar pause which is the key uh, to receptivity to the psychic impression. If the person who is about to make an important decision would stop for a moment, go by himself, relax and be still, and then very quietly put together the elements of his past. He would find that he has a skill that he did not suspect. That hasty decision may have complicated a situation that could otherwise be reasonable. It is this pausing, this stopping, this letting go of the conscious objective machinery of the plot and the scheme and the strategy. It is the individual attempting to make all major decisions from composure rather than from emergency. Emergency does not permit the psychic self to be heard. Emergency forces continually greater objectivity. The individual, as the emergency progressive, progressive must make his decisions from ever lower levels of his own intelligence until in panic, he makes the worst decision of all. Thus the idea that the ancients had, that in grave moments men should go into the temple and pray, and ask the help of God in their decision, simply meant that they should go, be quiet, state their problem internally, or in words if it so pleased them, addressing these, these words to the highest concept of truth which they could conceive. And then they should be quiet, attentive, and receptive to the answer. Whether the answer was to come through the oracle, or whether the answer was assumed to appear miraculously in their private lives. But this very process of placing ourselves in a mood of expectant relaxation, a mood in which we resolve to permit an impression from some superior level of consciousness to be received into our objective nature. This pause, this moment of quiet, opened the door in many instances, allowing the subjective 
to tell us its larger decision or to reveal to us more clearly uh, the elaborate complexity of the undertaking with which we were concerned. This meditational, prayer-like mood had its own relationship or similarity to sleep, for it was merely a partial receptivity, perhaps disciplined by religion or philosophy, but it was certainly the individual learning to listen for some kind of an inner voice, some kind of an inner impression, uh, which would intuitively enrich his decision. If, as in the case of modern man, we have come to almost completely ignore the spiritual overtone of life, in which a while perhaps we may claim to believe we make very slight practical use of our believing. It is evident uh, that the machinery of the mystical experience would alter its appearance. And under the conditions of today, there is less and less likelihood of this experience occurring to us while we are in a waking conscious state. Never before has waking consciousness of man been more totally locked in phenomena. Never before have we been so continually plagued with external pressure. Nor has there ever been a time when our self-discipline was as poorly organized and developed. We are most, for the most part, lack the capacity to relax or to enter into a truly meditative relationship with life. We are not able, in the waking state, to achieve true receptivity of consciousness. We are continually battling, and what a time we might like to spend in such meditative procedure may be so frequently interrupted as to make the procedure comparatively valuable. And so at last, after the long and difficult day, we tumble into bed. And our first release from our own problem is unconsciousness. And sometimes we are even deprived of this blessing, continuing to toss and thrash through the night, trying to escape the intensity of habit mechanisms which no longer permit us to rest even when the time is available. If, however, through physical or psychic fatigue, we actually go to sleep, we not only, for the first time, achieve a kind of relaxation, but never before in history has our psychic load been heavier. Uh, not too long ago, the individual psychic load was mostly grave concern for the immediate and imminent circumstances of his personal existence. He went along very much a creature of habit. He did not expect unusual reward. He was not particularly discontented. He accepted a lot similar to that into which he had been born. And his main worries involved sickness or loss or accidents and things of that nature. He was not uh, obsessed with world politics. He was not ready to collapse psychologically if the wrong candidate got in. He had none of these delightful measures that are burdening us even this fair evening. Actually, therefore, his psychic load was perhaps more religious than ours. His fear of sin was probably more acute than ours. His fear of nonconformity was more acute. But he was not in death beyond control. He was not afraid to be sick because he could not pay the doctor's bill. He was not under the psychic pressure of intense mechanism. He was not uh, jealous and envious to the degree that we are. And he did not uh, come face to face with the tremendous conflict of powerful personalities that today are normal. A lot. 
Thus his psychic load uh, did not impose itself so directly upon him, nor did it demand such a crushing and crashing breakthrough as the one we bear today. As a result of this uh, situation, we note that apparently uh, the psychological deep consciousness of man is more active now than ever before in our recorded history. This activity seems to mean that the person is more psychically stress-ridden than ever before, and that the insecurities of life are accumulating more rapidly than they used. And where this situation is not met with some uh, appropriate remedy, Nervous breakdowns are almost certain, heart trouble is more frequent than it used to be, and in spite of our elaborate scientific discoveries and the ways in which we can now combat many ailments, the public health is not as good as it was 50 years ago. Length of life in some cases is greater, but it is merely an extended period of time for acute mental anguish. Therefore, there is some doubt as to the favor that we have enjoyed. Bearing all these factors a little bit in mind, we can see why many persons under a heavy psychic load should have disturbed rest. This disturbance is of several natures and kinds. Some people just that they can't seem to sleep at all. Others, fitfully. Some have the sense of dreaming, but do not remember the dream. And of those dreams that are remembered, more and more are ominous. More and more are unpleasant dreams. Dreams which do not have much in them of contentment. They are not the dream of the happy child, be found in some fairy tale. They are the dreams that come close to nightmares. Uh, dreams in which man continues to experience the difficulty, perhaps intensified, uh, by which his daily life is so unhappily punctuated. This also uh, means that dreaming is sometimes a kind of safety valve. The individual, more or less symbolically, continues the lines of thought uh, with which he was previously concerned. Interpretation of such dream from a term point of standpoint of instruction is simply to point out that the individual is under too continuous attention that he is not able to disentangle himself sufficiently from his own physical and mental preoccupation to relax even when he has the chance. Similar said, what would be the best proof that there is no psychic stress in the individual. Well, there is no real way in which you can dogmatically answer such a question, but it seems to me that one of the proofs that the individual's pressures are not too great for him is that he can lie awake without sleeping, but in resting and in bed for eight hours without a negative thought. If he can rest, and his natural thoughts are pleasant, if perhaps he is inclined to indulge in certain fantasy that is charming, gentle, non-destructive, or if he can carry lightly through the hours uh, some pleasant prospect which he hopes to advance, and without straining the mind, maintains a subtle positivity, in which his thinking is advancing some good cause or advancing the solution of his own problem without pressure or tension. If he can do this, the chances are his nervous system is under control. If also in these situations he finds that he awakens reasonably refreshed from sleep when he does sleep, when his dreams are few, or when at least he has no memory of them. It may also probably be that his pressures are not too great. 
uh, we wonder sometimes if a certain type of sleep fatigue does not really testify to unremembered sleep activity. In other words, we may not have any remembrance of a dream. But if we wake up in a morning without sleep having refreshed us, we get out of bed as tired as when we went to bed. And there are no physical symptoms or no physical evidence to support the theory that we are suffering from a physical ailment of any kind, then it is quite possible that this lassitude is due to an intense sleep phenomena which was not remembered. Because if the various faculties do not rest adequately, then we do not have the sense of refreshment which should naturally follow rest. So if in the morning you wake up with the feeling that you have just finished a nine-round fight uh, without having any memory of the fight, but the full measure of exhaustion and a certain degree of psychic scarring, it is quite possible that there has been very little rest due to psychic pressure. Some persons do not naturally seem to dream as easily as others. And in many instances, Apparently, the dream mechanism does not immediately function. This is the reason why, under certain types of analytical thought treatment, uh, a person who has not dreamed will begin to do so. And having begun to stir the subconscious by analysis or by investigation, it suddenly becomes increasingly active and apparently aware that it will now be regarded, begins to produce phenomena. In dreaming, generally speaking, uh, dreams divide into several different types. And our own ability to recognize the nature of the dream appears to be innate. And even in the presence of some dream or sleep experiences, we have the awareness that we are asleep. In other cases, this awareness is lacking. The most important and vital dreams that come to the individual do not come in the period of greatest uh, uh, sleep or sleep maximum. Thus, dreams are not as likely to arise in the first four hours of sleep as they are toward morning or toward the time of wakening. A psychic dream maxima seems to be established an hour or two before the normal waking time. And as dreams frequently cause the individual to awaken, it seems as though man passes through a period in sleep, which is highly significant. The intensity or soundness of sleep gradually decreases. Normally, the person sleeps the most completely and heavily immediately after going to sleep. Gradually, over a period of hours, the sleep intensity diminishes, so that under normal conditions, the awakening is more gradual than the process of going to sleep. Not long prior to the point in which objectivity is restored by awakening, the sleeper passes into a condition between sleeping and waking which may be likened very much to the trance. He is not awake, but he is not fully and completely asleep. It is at this time that dreams, visions, premonitions are most vivid and most frequent. In these times, the individual frequently has a sense of being awake though still asleep, and experiences a combination of pressure. He is partly aware objectively, therefore is able to contribute uh, to the acceptance of the dream itself. He is partly subjective, and his condition may be likened to a deep meditation, or to a period of intensive uh, concentration or contemplative discipline. I would assume from what we are able to learn nowadays 
that your prodromic dream, or your dream which has to do with the uh, condition of the individual in some stressful situation, must usually break through at this time. Therefore, the important dream comes not in the soundness of it, but in the bridging of the sleep-waking state. Because after all, the pressureful dream seeks to be remembered. There is the desire that it should be recorded. Nature wants us to know that dream when we wake up. If we are unaware of the dream, it cannot serve us objectively. It cannot be an intercession from our own inner nature if we are not aware of it. So the problem of the dream bringing with it awareness of its own meaning or purpose is met by nature providing a peculiar relationship of sleeping and waking and to serve as the medium for this dream. Now, the dream itself uh, very often bears some more or less direct relationship to the problem involved, or to the question asked, or to the need which is present. This is not always, however, directly evident. The dream may be a moving dream, a from now forward, or from now upward, or from now downward. The dream summarizes in one way or another the nature of the confusion in ourselves and its true and often unrecognized cause. Now this is perhaps one of the keynotes of the entire situation. Things have several apparent causes and one true cause. The attitudes that we hold, the situations that arise in our lives, are nearly always related to some basic principle or to some basic factor with which we have been unable to cope successfully. Most persons' lives are projections of a small group of psychic patterns. These patterns may be traceable to early life. They may be traceable to shock or intensity or disappointment or tragedy. They may be the accumulation of habits. They may arise in our believing or in our lack of self-control or in our appetite. But there will nearly always be a few basic pressures which have become submerged and which are now known to us only by a series of scattered and sometimes apparently unrelated circumstances. It is very valuable for the individual attempting to correct a defect of character to become aware of the basic reason. One of the most common examples of this type of thing, is multiple marriage. An individual makes an unfortunate marriage. This uh, may happen to nearly anyone, and therefore there is nothing extraordinary about it. But after getting out of this difficulty, he makes another similar unfortunate marriage, and may have three or four such marriages during a lifetime, all essentially unfortunate all some way related together. The uh, person will always have an obvious reason. Uh, the other individual was either undesirable or misunderstood or had temperamental peculiarities resulting in incompatibility. But where a pattern continues over a series of similar instances, there is almost always a psychic cause somewhere in the consciousness of the individual himself. Or certain business procedures which cause a person to be in difficulties most of the time. And not long ago I received a letter from a man who has had a series of business difficulties. He says he tries very hard, he builds a good business, 
things apparently go very well, and then at the critical moment, he suddenly loses complete interest in his work. It is work which he likes to do, or thought he did. It is work in which he is reasonably successful. But all of a sudden, the job isn't interesting anymore. About this time, of course, a competitor takes over. Someone else moves into the position and the uh, person's own indifference causes him to lose his area of financial security. This has happened a dozen times. It has resulted in a broken home. It has added continuously and constantly to the difficulty of this person who has become radically disturbed and who has even reached the point of contemplating suicide. There seems to be no way out of this recurrent difficulty. Now, things of this nature cannot be considered merely as separate things. Where you have any basic temperamental intensity which is causing trouble, there may be a number of excuses but there has to be a reason. There has to be a true cause. The chronic worrier, the individual by nature critical, the born autocrat, uh, the person lacking adequate ambitional motive, uh, the person without stability, or the individual utterly and impossibly stubborn. These characteristics rise from something. And as long as they remain uncorrected, the characteristics will result in difficulty. The general thought used to be that if you have a bad disposition, get over it. Now, this is still to a measure good advice, but it has its limitations. If the cause of the trouble is more general and deeper than the dispositional peculiarity, and we merely inhibit the peculiarity by imposing will upon it, we will simply cause the major difficulty to break out elsewhere. Thus the individual who fought desperately uh, to overcome a bad temper finally was able to control the temper, but he became an alcoholic in the process. The problem was never solved. The value of your dream as an instruction fact is that it is frequently possible by means of dream analysis to penetrate into this area of essential cause. We find it possible to reach symbolically into the thing itself, that which is properly and eternally to blame, the thing that is real. Uh, for example, a very timid man uh, who had never had very much success in making up his mind, whose intellectual achievements were rather good, uh, but whose economic status was always hazarded by lack of personality drive. He simply could not advance his own call. He suffered from a terrible inferiority humble. And this led him to underestimate and undervalue himself and to be a considerable disappointment to those around him who had very little success in trying to transform him into a more positive and integrated person. He did not dream a great deal, in fact, very seldom. But under a process of analysis, he had a very interesting dream. And this dream was nothing more nor less than the dream of Jack and the Beanstalk. Now, for him, this might seem to be little more help than his previous unawareness of the situation. But the story of Jack and the Beanstalk has considerable psychological integration. And as the dream proceeded, uh, this Jack, seeing himself in the dream, 
uh, found in the fact that he had to conceal himself in the house of the ogre, who came in rumbling and grumbling and shouting, and terrified the uh, dreamer almost out of his wits. This phase of the dream continued to be prominent until it became obvious that somewhere in the life of this individual, the ogre factor tied into his timidity. Somewhere there was an ogre. Somewhere there was a giant. Now what was the final, more or less, clearing circumstance? It might be quite easy to say that this ogre could be a person. That this ogre might have been an overstern or dominating parent, or a cruel guardian. This ogre might also represent uh, some basic fear by which the individual tormented himself. This the ogre could be a form of guilt mechanism, in which the person could not dare to proceed because of something in his background of which he was frightened or ashamed. This ogre could be a moral element in his life, uh, which had never been uh, sublimated, or never been uh, clarified. But in this particular instance, the ogre represented a rather neutral thing in comparison to the intensity of the pattern. This person was a, an adopted person. And before adoption, he had remained for several years in a public institution. The public institution was the ogre. This public institution carried with it certain factors. First of all, as far as he was able to learn, he was illegitimate. He had been left in this institution, deserted by his parents. The institution itself had not been especially cruel to him. He had only been one of many unfortunate children who had to be cared for, but about whose inner life very little was thought. Finally, adoption brought a certain fulfillment of a better way of life, but the institution and the circumstances became this gigantic shadow this shadow of a forlornness in the beginning of life, this shadow of the world first experienced as a strangely heartless thing. Not cruel, but simply without heart. And combined to that, the fact that society had gradually revealed to him the fact that he himself was probably nameless, had been deserted and unwanted. As a result of this, the world gradually became the extension of the uh, orphanage. And everything in the world that happened to him became an extension of this cruel message that had reached him in early life, that stamped him with a peculiar mark of being a para or an outcast. To make the matters a little more complicated, this man, in his self-pride, trying to fight this thing inside of himself, had completely submerged it. He had told no one. It was only after analysis began that he even admitted that he had ever been in an office. And it was only after a long period of work with a counselor that he finally, almost tearfully, uh, reveals his legitimacy. These factors all combine together with the sensitivity of his own nature to produce this older kind of dream. Somewhere he had read the story. Somehow he knew it. He related both the relevant and the irrelevant part. He went through the early part of the dream, but without any particular emotional involvement. He climbed up the beanstalk. He did all these things. But when he came into the house where the ogre was, he became completely paralyzed with fear. Fear that the world 
uh, would know this awful secret that he had carried throughout his life. Fear that the world would hurt him again. Fear that somebody new would hunt him out and finally expose him. It was all a very sad, almost ridiculous situation. Yet it had eaten deeply into the life of an individual. And this sense of inadequate origin had prevented him from ever achieving anything beyond that origin. He felt himself as one born to slavery, born to a lower way of life, born to humility and humiliation. After a considerable degree of counseling, the ogre dream finally was overcome. And it was overcome not in the way that it might be expected that the ogre disappeared or that little Jack was able to get down the beanstalk and cut it down as in the original story so that the ogre and everything perished together. But in this case, there was a gradual transformation of the ogre. And it ended up by the dreamer and the dream being of a very compatible nature. The fellow was getting along excellently with the ogre at the last report. He had overcome the fear. But the ogre seemed apparently to be a symbol suitable to summarize the shadow, this heavy imponderable that hurt all the time. Uh, there is also a good case of what we might term the Amphortus dream. It bears a similar kind of stigma. You remember in the Grail legend, Amphortus, the king of the Grail, attempted to rescue uh, the holy spear from the black magician. But the black magician turned the spear and thrust it into the side of Amphortus. Amphortus had intended to use the spear to destroy the power of evil. But the power of evil took hold of the spear and wounded the king of the grail. This wound would not heal. And the dream of the, of the Amphortus nature is usually the dream of some kind of a sickness or a deformity, or an ill that will not get well. It is sometimes one of the commonest forms of it, is the eternal toothache. Uh, there are cases where an individual has dreamt month after month of having this toothache. Nothing could be done about it. Uh, dentists and everyone tried. But the toothache continued. It could not be cured. Other individuals are crippled. A sensing deformity in a dream. A deformity which by its very nature will not get well. Thus this important type of dream, the dream of the wound that will not mend, uh, seemingly is related to a certain kind of psychological problem to which the person has associated an inevitability. He has decreed that this condition shall not and will not change. Now this conscious decreeing of this usually involves some kind of loyalty. It represents a person sometimes obligated, either by circumstances or self-obligation to a way of life or to a situation which gradually becomes unendurable. Sometimes it is this old story of matter of principle. The dream that will not get well has also been associated with a kind of loss from which the person never expects to be able to recover. A man of in his, a man in his early 60s, unwise or unreasonable investment, lost most of his world holdings. This resulted in a dream relating to not getting well. The man consciously believed that he was too old to recuperate, to recoup his fortune. That therefore he was now in a hopeless condition of financial sickness. He was sick with an incurable ailment. And wherever the ailment is, in, is incurable, 
It is involved in the idea that the individual cannot correct the prevailing condition. There are cases also in which, for example, a religion preventing divorce, two persons living together who are unable to attain any degree of compatibility. Either one of those persons, and even both, may develop this dream of not getting well, of things continuing and going on. A criminal who has been convicted of a major crime and has served his sentence returns to society but has this sentence hanging over his head. As a result of that, he is never able to feel sure that his social condition will uh, be any value to him. He is always afraid that his record will catch up with him. This very often results again in his not getting well dream. He doesn't dare to become too much associated with anything for fear that his old crime will destroy any new relationship or values which he may build. He may also, with this type of dream, be one who has tried to conceal his older record. Usually it is the concealment factor which results in the pressure that disturbs the life. This pressure disturbing the life of the individual, this dream of not getting well, very often means a very spotty and unfortunate career, the type of life that may end on Main Street, the type of individual whose incentives have perished and who has no sense of being able to restore his own nature. Now this dream is instructive. It is not merely there to tell him that he cannot get well. It is there to point out to him that his condition is due to this factor, is due to this pattern. Sometimes, the moment the dream is presented and analyzed, the whole mystery is solved. The uh, subject immediately realizes that this is his dilemma. It is then necessary to point out that his condition is not due to the fact that he cannot get well. It's the fact that he has no libido in this area. That he is psychologically, he has drained off his resources and has no energy with which to energize any activity. The energy is all flowing away from him in the blood of his wound. If he can gain a different relationship to the incident, if he can awaken to the full fact that he is not actually the victim of the circumstances with which he has separately explained each of his failures. The first time the job wasn't much good. The second time the boss was impossible. The third time he had to work with people who uh, made life difficult for him. Another time he lost his job due to the ulterior motive of another employee, and so on, on and on, until the pressure of explanation obscured the original fact that he really lost all of these things simply because he had resolved inside of himself to let go of life. Life was punishing him psychologically. Therefore, it was his duty to punish life. And one of the ways in which we punish life is to destroy ourselves, because in each of us, our own life is symbolic of life in general. So the wound can be healed the moment the person realizes that it originates in a complex, or originates in a pattern, which has gradually become a reality, not in itself, but through its symptoms. And just as a dream gives one group of symbols for the interpretation of the situation, so the circumstances in which the person passed form another group of symbols bearing upon the original cause. Once this cause is recognized, once the individual comes face to face with it, he can begin to work with it. And he discovers the degree in which he has succeeded by the gradual transformation of the dream content itself. 
Finally, if he is successful in what he is doing, whatever the adversary is, becomes a friend. Whatever the difficulty is, heals. And in some mysterious way, the wound is cured, even though there was no expectation that it could be. An individual hobbling along as a psychological cripple under a very peculiar fixation experienced a dream in which he was miraculously healed when the fixation itself was broken. Now, he was suspicioned of a rationalist that he could not accept in his own mind the mere fact that suddenly, as a cripple, he could walk again. Therefore, to rationalize this in his own mind, he devised a dream miracle by which he was able to make his healing reasonable by drawing upon the miracle content of world legendary and tradition. He found, however, a way to symbolically present the remedy which had come to him. Thus, whenever we discover the psychological content of a dream and its meaning, the dream itself must be observed, and under therapy the dream generally continues. And as this dream it comes under the influence of therapy, it gradually changes its own content. And when the content of the dream is no longer dangerous, or no longer difficult, or tragic, and no longer a restraint, we are then reasonably assured that the basic cause of the attitude has been reached. That the basic cause has been corrected. From this point on, the secondary symptoms fall away of themselves. So they cannot exist apart from the cause of themselves. Thus the dream reveals the cause and also helps us to discover the degree of remedy which we have achieved. In this way and in many other ways, the dream is a very instructive experience. But our time is up, so we'll have to do some more instructing next week. Thank <laughs> you.